So typically at the bridge, what we do for a sermon series is we take a book of the Bible and we just, we go through it uh, slowly. So at the beginning of the year, we started with 1 Corinthians and then um, this summer we went through Exodus and then this fall we went through 1 John. Uh, we're taking a little bit of a break from doing books and we're doing a, a new series that we're calling Three. Three. It's a two-week series. Maybe we should call it two. No, three. Three is, uh, three is perfect. I, lo- I love the number three. I-, I like three. I got three kids. I got three wives. Uh, no, I'm joking. Can you imagine? Can't even handle my one. Um, I, I, no, but there is something about the number three that, that I like. There's something poetic, actually, about three in, in a series. But um, that's not why we're calling this series three. Today, we're looking at three different types of people. You are one of three different types of people. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And then next week, we'll look at another series of, of three. So we're calling it three. Simple, yes. Creative, man, eh, who cares? Luke chapter 10 is where we're at. Luke chapter 10, really encourage you to grab a Bible. We've got Bibles in the chairs. Otherwise, I know a lot of people use phones with the Bridge app. We've got the Bible on there. You can take notes on there as well. But Luke chapter 10, this is going to be fun. We're just going to dive into a story that Jesus tells. And so I'd love it if you have the text in your hands as we, as we look at this. A little context before, I, before we uh, pray and jump in. Um, Jesus is in Jerusalem at this point, and, uh, and he's doing what he did most of the time. He's teaching. And then he takes some Q&A. And doing Q&A with a crowd is very risky because you get a lot of stupid questions. I know there's that, that, that comment out there, like, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I disagree. I've heard many, many stupid questions in my lifetime. <laughs> I think some people just ask a question just so that, you know, they can make a comment or, or be heard. Um, and I'm sure Jesus fielded a lot of really dumb questions. Thankfully, the writers don't include that in, in Scripture. But Jesus does get a really good question from, from um, somebody. Uh, one, one guy asks, if, if you're telling me to love my neighbor, that's like a big teaching of yours, Jesus. If you're telling me to love my neighbor as myself, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus goes into this story, which is what we're going to look at. And the main application for this story is that our neighbor is everyone, regardless of color, culture, socioeconomic class. Anyone that we come into contact with is our neighbor. We are to love them like we love ourselves. That's the explicit theme in the story that we're going to jump into. But there's this beautiful implicit theme that plays out kind of in the background. There's this secondary application. Something to understand with scripture is scripture has one interpretation, that's a big deal, one interpretation, but many applications. And today we're gonna we're gonna hone in on one of those secondary applications that Jesus uh, gives. And so we're gonna dig a little deeper into the story than most people do. It'll totally be worth it though. This is a lot of fun. Let me pray, we'll jump right into it. God, we thank you so much for for your word. God, I, I thank you for thank you for Jesus sharing this story. God, may you uh, work in us. Uh, may we be open to your Holy Spirit, uh, convicting, illuminating this text to us, but also convicting. Uh, God, you are going to speak to us uh, right now. I ask that we listen and really zero in on, on what you have to say. May you fill this church, not just with people, but may you fill this church with conviction and power. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as the Lens of scripture zooms in on on Luke chapter 10. The sky behind him radiates an orange hue. It would be enjoyable if the sky in front of him weren't boasting jet black. See, for the last couple of hours, he's picked up pace. He's trying to beat the sunset. But the more the sun dips, the lower his heart sinks. The sun won the race, and the loser is now being engulfed in an eerie darkness. Everyone knows this is is a road you don't travel at night, especially alone. There's just just too many stories, too many stories of murders, of of muggings, of, of animal attacks. This road is the road that horror stories are about. And now he finds himself in the worst possible situation. He's exhausted from running. He slows down to catch his breath, but his rapid heart rate won't lower. It'll only speed up because panic is setting in. This road ahead of him carries on into a blackness, a blackness of only God knows who awaits in that blackness. The silhouetted trees above him sway in the wind. A howling breeze seems to cut right through him. Each sound of a bush rustling makes him jump. The light of the city is just over that hill. Hopefully tomorrow he'll be there bragging about surviving this road this night. 
And Jesus brings us into the story. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, if, you, if you've uh, never been to uh, Jerusalem or, or Jericho, you should come with me sometime. But Jerusalem is, is up on a mountain. This is kind of the context that Jesus is giving. Jerusalem is up on a mountain. It's a mountain city. Jericho is a bigger city down below. Uh, Jericho is actually below sea level. So this road drops 3,300 feet within 17 miles. If you're walking this road, it's about a five-hour walk. And Jesus is giving us these details. You ever wonder why? Why does Jesus give details? Why? Like, this is, this is a parable. It doesn't really matter, the, these details. Why, why is Jesus giving a, the, us these details? And for those of us who are more analytical or, or methodical, we, we like data, uh, you might be thinking, this really doesn't matter where the guy is, which road it is, because he doesn't exist. Why is Jesus giving us this unnecessary detail about a guy walking between Jerusalem to Jericho? Well, first, so that people can picture it. These people that are listening to Jesus talk, they know this road. Many of them walked this road to get up to Jerusalem just the other day. In fact, days before this, Jesus was on this road. And as Jesus is telling the story, he's picturing what is going on, and he's inviting his listeners into the story. See, the people sitting around him on the Temple Mount, their minds right away are thinking, oh yeah, that that road that that dips down from from here, it goes through that big olive tree orchard. Uh, My kid's getting their knee running down that that hill just uh, on their way up. Uh, I, I know exactly what you're talking about right now, Jesus. And he's inviting them into this picture, but he's also personalizing it. He wants them and he wants us to put ourselves in the traveler's shoes. And so as they're sitting there listening to Jesus teach, they're thinking, oh yeah, that would totally suck to be be there at night all alone. It's the worst, trying to, you know, get to a city before nightfall, been there, it's terrifying. It's funny, people um, have argued in this story, this is a very well-known story, people have argued, I don't know, who is this guy? A lot of commentators, um, you know, or scholars like to speculate, you know, is, is, is this guy a Jew? Is he a Roman? Is he rich? Is he young? Is he poor? Why doesn't Jesus tell us who this guy is? Because he's you. For a moment, Jesus wants you to put yourself in his shoes. He's on the road. Verse 30, he continues on, between Jerusalem and and Jericho. A man is going between Jerusalem and Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Poor guy doesn't make it. I know you were cheering him on, but he got jumped. Unable to move, he he lays there for for hours in in darkness. The thugs have run off, and this is when the animals close in. This is an area known for bears roaming, leopards roaming, hyenas. Not too long before this, Samson actually ripped open a lion in these parts, and so apparently there's lions. And this guy is sitting meat on the road. He reaches for a rock for protection and just prays for sunrise. And it comes. And not just the sun He finally gets a stroke of luck. A silhouette of a man appears up the road. And as it gets closer, it's not just any man. It's a man of God. Verse 31. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So for whatever reason, the priest doesn't give him the time of day. It could have been that the priest didn't want to defile himself because if he touched the guy who's bleeding, then he would have had to go cleanse himself. If he got near somebody who was, who was you know, about to die, he'd have to go through this whole ritual, days of, of rituals to, to cleanse himself. That's annoying, so it could be that he doesn't want to stop for, for that reason. It could have been that the priest is afraid of the robbers, that they're still nearby, doesn't, I just don't want to get involved. But either way, the, the, priest, the priest goes, ew, like, ain't nobody got time for that, and he continues on. So likewise, a a Levite, second silhouette, appears up up the road. When he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Levites assisted priests in the the temple. Um, They they were looked up to in society. People had a high regard for Levites because it was that line that, that um, that gave the nation priests. It was through the line of Levi that priests would become priests. And so uh, Le- Levites were very highly regarded in this society. So you have another religious guy, same thing. Doesn't even want to get close enough to inspect, goes under the other side of the road. Poor guy's over for two. But the third guy, number three, third guy's a charm. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. We saw him. He had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Samaritan. 
That's another detail that's important. Uh, there's a lot of friction between Jews, and there, there was a lot of friction between Jews and, and Samaritans. And, and reason for it, there's some history as to why there, there's friction between these two people groups. 700 years before, before this story, 700 years before Jesus, the Jews were defeated by the Assyrians and they were taken captive, taken back to Assyria. Some Jews were left behind. The Jews that were shipped out, they held on to their culture. It was very hard, but they held on to their culture. Um, they, living in a, in a foreign land, they, they managed to um, not give up their, their worship of God and they held on to their culture. When they returned back, they found that the Jews who were left behind, they intermarried with Assyrians and they adopted some Assyrian culture. And so there's some bitterness between the two. The Jews that came back go, okay, what the heck? Like, we went there, it was a lot harder. We had a lot harder than you. We stuck it out. You stayed behind and folded like a cheap suit. And so ever since the Jews returned back, uh, they called those people Samaritans. They're not Jews anymore. They're, 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 they have a different culture. They have a different worship style. And so the Samaritans, they feel a little left out. They feel a little looked down on, and it was true, and some reason for it. One of these Samaritans is walking down the road, notices blood on the trail, finds the guy laying there, bandages him up, takes valuable oil, wine, pours it on his wounds, and takes him to an inn. Generosity goes even further. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So he just writes a blank check. He had done enough, right? Bandages the wounds, takes the guy to an inn. That's already way above and beyond. But the Samaritan goes further. I'll put you up until you're good to go. And then this, at this point in the story, Jesus poses the question, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Obviously the Samaritan. That is the main theme and the application for the story. But there's something else playing out here. There's this implicit question that Jesus is asking without saying. This is Jesus' brilliance as a teacher. He's communicating an underlying thought without explicitly saying what that thought is. He's allowing people to kind of arrive there by themselves. So let's go there. Take yourself out of the traveler's shoes. There's three different types of people that the traveler meets on the road. There's the robbers, there's the religious guys, and there's the rescuer. And you and me, we fall into one of those three categories. Oh, this is so good. Three types of people, let's list them, let's talk about them, and then let's see who you are. There are, number one, the takers. The takers. They're the robbers, the ones who uh, who are out to take and to get. And here's what's happening, is immediately we look at this and we go, okay, well, that's not me. We just dismiss this one. If I'm anyone in the story, I'm not the robbers. I don't jump people, I don't take their stuff, I never have, you know, or that life is you know, long behind me. I am not this. Well, let's think about that for a second. You ever hear of the, uh, the European cuckoo bird? This guy might look cute, but don't be fooled. He's a little jerk. Uh, European cuckoos uh, will find hedge sparrows, a hedge sparrow's nest, and when the hedge sparrow is gone, the cuckoo bird will come in and they will lay their eggs in the, in the nest, and then they'll take off. They don't take responsibility for their young. They actually leave it for the hedge sparrow to raise. So the hedge sparrow will come back and to the nest and do all the work, feed them, protect them, and, they will, and the hedge sparrow will raise the cuckoo birds. Cuckoo birds are takers. Now, they don't physically take anything from the other birds. They're not stealing worms or, or, or nests or, you know, or, or stealing their young, but they're takers. They skirt responsibility. They expect others to pick up their slack. And when we think about being a taker in that context, we got to admit, eh, okay, I do that a little bit, at least a little bit. You know, I'm not out there beating people for their money, but sometimes I'm hoping somebody else picks up my slack. Like, I'm not taking from anyone, but... I'm hoping somebody else will raise my kids. Child raising can be a drag. It's hard. So I'm going to put that responsibility of raising them on others. I'm going to put it on eh, the school system. I'm going to put it on my other spouse. I'm going to put it on my parents. I'm not going to buck up and intentionally train and sacrifice. I, I, I want the kids as little as possible. Just put that on others. That's a sign of a taker. Another sign of a taker, captured in one picture. Let's see how much this annoys you. Anyone else get annoyed when they see this? 
This is like my pet peeve. Put the freaking cart away. Don't leave it out for someone else, you cuckoo bird. Takers, or another sign of a taker, littering, throwing your trash out the window or around the ground. You're a taker, someone else will get it or we'll just all live with that trash blowing around. It's a taker. Uh, the person who zooms past the, uh, the cars lined up in construction in the construction zone and then cuts right in. <laughs> oh, that hurt, didn't it? It's a taker. Or the, uh, the person who balances the stuff on the trash can, instead of taking the trash out, we're gonna play Jenga with, with the trash. That way the next person who comes to throw something away, like I just started some household wars, didn't I? Takers, you cuckoo birds. Uh, the person who doesn't shovel their sidewalk in the winter. It's the person who parks over the sidewalk, not thinking of little kids or, or, or people on their bikes or, or people walking who wanted to go across the sidewalk. It's the people who never ask questions in conversation. They just want to talk about themselves. It's a, it's a taker. It's the person in the office who doesn't clean the microwave after they warmed up spaghetti and now the microwave looks like a horror house. It's a taker. Need I go on? It's the person who doesn't clean up after their dog. It's the person who spits their gum out on the parking lot. Someone else can step in it. It's the person who doesn't refill the Keurig or the coffee pot. It's the person who attends church but never contributes, doesn't give or, or really give much, but appreciates the lights on and, and the heat on. That's other people's responsibility, though. They can take care of that. Takers leave church going, what did I get from church today? Was the sermon good? Was the music good? What did I get today? That's, that's a taker. I'm not trying to sound like an old man. I kind of feel like this whole week I was just like writing down everything I get annoyed by. I'm not trying to sound like an old man. I, I'm just trying to say I think there's a lot more cuckoo birds in this room than we may think. And there's one in me. And so maybe there's a taker in all of us. Maybe. Some more than others. Takers mainly only think of, of their needs, their wants. If, if someone gets something nice or, or, or has something nice, they can't be happy for them because, because they don't have it for themselves. Takers often say or, or think things like, you know, well, nobody ever does that for me. When can I have that? When's my time coming? Their thoughts are only directed at their needs and their wants. The other thing takers do is they're highly manipulative people. They see a relationship as something they, they can use or leverage to get what they want. They use people. When Nicole and I, when we snowboard in northern Wisconsin, we, we drive by this, uh, this hotel where John Dillinger had, had a shootout with the law. Uh, do you know that John Dillinger, gunslinging gangster, murderous thief, I mean, just a thug, was known as a uh, gentleman, attractive personality? Like if, if, if you were giving him what he wanted, nice guy, great guy, if you weren't giving them what he wanted, it was the last face you see. It's a taker. Takers, ha takers can have attractive personalities. They can be nice. They can be kind. They can be friendly. But they use people. They struggle to contribute to a relationship without trying to get something back. They're highly manipulative. I was talking with, with our staff uh, a couple weeks ago. I've been taking our, our uh, staff to the um, in, in, in staff meeting, we've been, taking, we've been going through uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And so we've just been meditating on the fruit of the Spirit together. And, and so last week I was talking about the fruit of the Spirit, kindness. And when it comes to kindness, true kindness is never leveraged to get anything in return. It's like I remember my dad telling me a long time ago, um, he said, he said uh, sometimes, and not all the time, but Junior, sometimes the, the friendliest, nicest people are takers. Manipulative, they are kind, and they are nice, often overly nice, until they don't get what they want. Because they're leveraging kindness and relationships to get something. And if we really think about that, I think we're all guilty of that at some point, at least in our past, but I think we might be guilty of that even right now. Whether to make a sale, or to get a date, or to get somebody to do something. Takers have this pattern. So, is there a little bit of a taker in you? Second person is the keepers. The keepers, and you're a keeper in my book. Eh, okay, I gotta make like 45 of these a year, so I, you know, see it running out of jokes toward the end of the year here. Uh, takers, this is, the, this is the one person the majority of us really see ourselves as, and so as we look at these three, most of us are gonna go, okay, well, that's me, I'm person number two. It's funny, uh, most of us always, whenever we have to grade ourselves, we always kind of put ourselves in the middle, you know, we always think like, well, I'm not that bad, but I, like, I got work to do, so I kind of put myself in the middle. 
And okay, like whether that's true or not, like that's fine, but you shouldn't be happy with landing here and being person number two. Uh, This is the priest in the story. This is the Levite in the story. They walked past the need and thought, you know, it's not my problem. It's not my responsibility. It's my time. It's my money. And I'm going to keep it. You do you over there on the ground and I'll do me. Peace out. Uh, In in April, I I went to Tennessee with a bunch of guys on staff. We were doing some fishing and we found this uh, spillway um, with these huge fish just hanging out by the spillway. And, and Denim, our student, student pastor, he was freaking out. You know, these are huge fish. And so we're sitting there trying to catch them. We're not catching any of them. One guy walked up and he said, you need spoon lures, guys. Uh, they go for these. And so he was using a spoon lure and just reeling them in. We're like cheering them on. It was a lot of fun. Um, but we didn't have any spoon lures that we, that we could use. And so Denim asked the guy, he said, hey, do you have an extra spoon lure that I could borrow just to catch a fish? And the guy goes, no, man, I'm sorry. Two minutes later, he opens his tackle box and about 50 spoon lures just fall right out. It's like, you gotta be kidding me, bro. It's keepers. Keepers stockpile. You know that whole toilet paper craze last year during COVID? Really made no sense, but a society of keepers felt like that was the item to stockpile. The day after Thanksgiving, we're gonna see keepers versus takers in a cage match fighting over TVs at Target. Keepers find security in their stockpile, whether it's an account, a closet, a garage, a storage unit. Keepers find security and confidence in what they have. Now, again, I'm not speaking against savings. That is a biblical practice, but there's a difference between saving and stockpiling. It's a really good book called The Psychology of of Money, and I read it a while ago, and then I just kind of skimmed through it um, recently. Essentially, the book is all about how we live our lives moving goalposts throughout our whole life. You spend your whole life moving goalposts. And this is, this is true for me. So for example, when Nicole and I, when we got married, um, like, like maybe you, Nicole and I, had, we had very little. She was a nursing student. I was making a couple hundred bucks a week working at church. We had this little apartment next to a drug dealer. And our, our cars were, were old. Our kitchen table, we had found that on the side of the road. Just kind of fun memories of that first place. I would lay in bed at night, our first year of marriage, just dreaming of getting a new vehicle, one that worked every time, and maybe one where you could unlock the car with a, uh, with a key, like with a remote key. Like if we had that, we saved up and we got one, little little key of soul. We got the goal. And then we thought, you know, let's move the goalposts. Let's get a house. Let's get a house of our own, you know, where CD people aren't hanging out outside of our apartment door. And so we got one, an, an old stucco home, a 1970s kitchen. So we move in, we're like, all right, you know what? Let's move these goalposts again. We need to redo the kitchen. We need to make this home our own. So we saved up and we redid it. New kitchen. Move the goalposts again. I think we need a bigger house, babe. Like Nicole keeps popping girls out. I think we need, I think we need more bathrooms. So let's move these goalposts again. And now we have a house with more ba- bathrooms. The other night, uh, Nicole and I were talking. So I have a truck, and uh, a few nights ago, Nicole had said, um, she said, you know, Junior, if, if I picked up more shifts at the hospital, we could probably get, like, a bigger used truck. You know, the girls are getting bigger. They would have a bigger back seat. Like, you should get a bigger truck. I said, I've never been more attracted to you in my life. But it sparked a, a good discussion. At what point, Nicole... And, and this is more of Nicole asking me because she's the one actually who brought it up and keeps bringing it up. At what point do we stop moving these goalposts for our personal lives? What point do we just say, okay, this is good. Now, there's nothing wrong with progress and, and doing more and enjoying your hard work. That's fantastic. That's great. But at what point, and this is a good question for you to ask yourself, at what point are you going to go, we're good. Like, this is good. I don't need to move the goalposts again. Don't need to chase another carrot here. Let's just enjoy this. Be more generous, bless others, tap out of the rat race. Oh, still grow as a professional. You know, grow your earning power, grow the business, grow your worth to the company, get better. But when do you personally say, financially, you know, when it comes to the toys and the stockpiling and the bigger and the better and the stuff, I don't know, I'm, I'm good here. I'm going to use my resources to leave a legacy and do something much bigger and better and sit there and collect. See, keepers, like myself, we really struggle with this idea because personally for me, 
I'll admit to you, I like moving the goalposts. I love moving the I like the feeling. I, I, like, I like the feeling of when we moved out of our apartment, our small little apartment, and we walked into a house. It felt like a great husband. You know, that was, that was a good feeling. I like the feeling of, of, uh, of my wife moving from a clunker to a, to a car that had a remote unlocking button. That was a good feeling for me. I love the feeling of telling my girls in our house, hey, this is your bathroom, you stay out of ours. That was a good feeling. And keepers, we get addicted to that feeling. Let's keep moving the goalposts. Better cars, more cars. Let's get another garage. Let's get another closet. Let's get a storage unit. Another purse to the collection. Another comma to the account. Another addition. We like that feeling, but we miss out on the feeling of just calling the game at some point saying, you know what, no, I'm, I'm good here. I could do more. I could drive that. I could live there. I could have that, but I'm good here. I'm doing something bigger now. And that feeling is an acquired taste, but it beats that goalpost game that we play our whole lives. So at what point are you gonna call it? At what point are you gonna stop moving these goalposts? Most people chase that carrot right into the grave. When are you gonna just call it? See, there's so many people in our church who have made that decision. People I, I so admire that I so look up to. I think of a, a couple of our elders actually who had se- successful careers and at one point they just said, you know what, I'm not moving the goalposts anymore. Uh, I'm gonna do something bigger now. And they're just very generous with the church, giving so much time to the church and resources to the church. I know a couple of guys in our church who put off retirement for a couple of years to literally help build projects, like buildings for our church. I think of a woman a very special woman, successful career. She owns a business, and then she started doing real estate on the side. She serves like mad. She lives a very, very, very simple life. You wouldn't think she has the amount of money that she has, but she just gives greatly. So many people in our midst who said, you know what, I'm good here. I, 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 now I'm gonna do something bigger with my life. I'm done being a keeper. I'm stopping for the guy in the road, and I'm gonna live a better story. I'm gonna be person number three. And speaking of person number three, it's the givers. It's the givers. You go back to Jesus' story, the, the traveling Samaritan saw a need and actively said, I'm going to see this all the way through. I like to imagine the Samaritan looks in his coin purse and he sees two coins and he thought, uh, two days from Samaria. These are two nights worth of staying somewhere. I kind of need these to get home. But you know what? I'll just go get more. I got earning power. I can move things around. I'm in a position to see this guy through. And that's a giver. Is it just me or, or are you like this too? We'll move money around to do more or get more, but rarely to give more. Like, oh, I like that truck. I'd like to redo the kitchen, really want to go on that trip. So I'll move things around. You know, I'll cash that out. I'll refinance. I'll put less here, pick up that extra shift. I'll eat canned soup for a month and then they'll get it. And that's fantastic. That's great. But then we walk by somebody on the side of the road or we think, you know what? I really should tithe. I really, I really should give toward a project. I should be more vested in the kingdom of God. We see a need. We go, you know, but I, I only got a couple hundred left here at the end of the month. You know, it's all I got. It's like, whoa, whoa. And, and this is, again, I'm not trying to be convicting for you. This is more me preaching to myself. It's like, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. I was just creative and I moved a bunch of things around to get what I wanted last month, but now I only got a coin for this in my pocket? See, the Samaritans or givers, they go, no, I'm in a position to do more than the change that I have left over. I can be creative. I can move things around. I can see this further than the leftover change in my pocket. See, the truth is the happiest people, the most satisfied people, the people who struggle less with comparison and envy, the most confident people, they fall in this category right here. They gave up the goalpost game looking around and trying to you know, compare and, and, and push the goalposts. They gave all that up and just found something better. In fact, I would go as far as to say, if you ever find yourself in a funk, you ever find yourself there? Maybe you're there right now. You're just not enjoying life. 
kind of in a funk, you know, you're struggling with image, you're struggling with comparison, or you're just generally dissatisfied, you just kind of feel like you're in this funk, I would argue giving more could be the quickest way out of that. I realized this a couple of years ago. I, uh, we were up visiting Nicole's uh, family up in Wisconsin, and uh, she's from this little small town filled with antique stores and boutiques, and they have this old-fashioned ice cream shop. And so after a long day at the lake, we, we went into the uh, ice cream shop, and, and my youngest, she was just in this foul mood. And, uh, and, and she's gotten enough spankings to know that she can't, like, you know, freak out or, or, or be mean, but... Um, so she just kind of walks to the corner of the ice cream shop and, and she sticks her face in, in, you know, in a cup of ice cream. And knowing that she was in a bad mood, I went over and I sat by her and I asked her for some ice cream. And she goes, no, mine. Now, I'm not okay with that. There's like, there's enough brats in this world. I'm not adding another to the mix. I paid for the ice cream. I could take it away. I could throw it away. I could give her away. And so I sat down by her and I just made her, made her give me a bite. Now, the truth is I didn't need her ice cream. I didn't even like it. It was actually pretty gross. I had my own better ice cream, but I wanted to change her little heart. And the quickest way to change her little heart was for her to give me some of that ice cream. So I made her give me some. And with a big sigh and a furrowed brow, she just sticks a spoon out. And I kid you not, I'm not making this up. The, The moment I took a bite, her face visibly changed. Not 30 seconds later, she's like giggling and offering me more ice cream. Because there's something powerful, so powerful, about giving and surrendering. And this is why God pushes us to be person number three. He doesn't need your money. Man, I used to hate talking about giving. I was with some pastors earlier today, and they're like, what are you you preaching on this weekend? They're like, ah, giving. And they're like, oh, man, that totally sucks. I used to hate it. I used to try to put it off. And, uh, and I get it, I, mainly because I know churches who, who just abuse when it comes to, to giving. And so I used to just get up here and apologize and beat around the bush, but I've gotten to this point where I'm just like, you know what, screw it. A quarter of Jesus' sermons were about money. We're about this topic. And not because Jesus needed money. He could feed 5,000 families with a Lunchable. The reason that Jesus talked about this so much, the reason that God wants you to participate generously in the kingdom of God, the reason God wants you to be person number three is it does wonders for you. It directly affects your heart. Some of us are little toddlers running around, taking, skirting responsibility, making messes for others to clean up, running around saying, that's mine, that's mine, I had that first, I had that first, I had that first, and God's going, man, that's miserable. I don't want you like that. I made you to live above all that. I designed you to be a giver just like me, your creator. You are to give. And when you find yourself there, you find yourself firing on all cylinders, transcending that insatiable comparison rat race. God says, I'm inviting you to give it all up, do something bigger, do something better, and become person number three. Which person are you? I've used this book before as an illustration, but it was, it was my favorite book growing up. It's uh, If Everybody Did by Joanne Stover. I can still hear my mom's voice reading this to me when I was little. It's actually kind of a disturbing book. I don't think it would get published today. It's, uh, it's teaching kids not to be takers, but again, in, in, in a very weird, almost disturbing way. Like, actually, I have a few of these uh, pages up here. Look at this. So one of the pictures says, make a big splash. Well, if this is what would happen if everybody did. So it's like you know, a kid playing this thing. If everybody did that, we'd all be drowning. Or step on daddy's feet. Well, this is what would happen if everybody did. Oh, it gets better. Squeeze the cat. Well, if everybody squeezed the cat, this is what would happen. It just, it doesn't get much better than, than children's books like, like, like this. I, I think this book had a huge impact on my, my own psyche. This book really messed me up. The other day, my girls were playing with Play-Doh and, and they made this huge mess. And um, I hate Play-Doh. And, you know, it's just crusty, it gets everywhere, you can't get it off stuff. And so they made this huge mess all over the table. So I walked in and I said, what if everybody made a mess of Play-Doh like this? This world would be a terrible, crusty Play-Doh place to live, girls. You want to live in a world like that? And you're like, I don't know, that kind of sounds pretty cool, actually. I took this book, though, to my, my daughter's school because uh, they had asked for parents to come in and, you know, read the, 
read a book to the class. And so I, I signed up and I brought this in and I read it to the class and all the kids were laughing because it's a great book. And the look on the teacher's face, she's just looking at me like, what is wrong with you? I was like, you have no idea, but you should definitely come to the bridge. <laughs> but humor me for a second. Let's, let's say we added a, a page to this book. And the, the page that we added to the book said something like this. Give like you. Give to Jesus' church like you. Sacrifice like you. This is what would happen if everybody did. What would that page for you look like? Would there be a church? Give like you. Sacrifice like you. This is what would happen if everybody did. Some of us right now are thinking, man, I, honestly, based on my sacrifice, I can envision the church doing quite a bit. Others of us are thinking, okay, if everybody gave like me, probably wouldn't be doing much. And some of us might be sitting here thinking, I don't even think I could envision the chair that I'm sitting in right now. See, the kingdom of God is funded by Samaritans. It's funded by givers. It's funded by threes. The common statistic is that 20% of church attenders make up for 80% of the church budget. 20% of church people are threes. It's got to change. Not so that the church can get more money, but so that the church people, we, can experience what it's like to live the way God designed us, to live bigger stories, to stop pushing the goalposts and chasing carrots and living like cuckoo birds, but to just give it up and live a story that's worth telling. I don't know, maybe I'm a little too direct. I kind of feel like I was. At the same time, going into this text and what Jesus just constantly hits over and over and over when it talks about giving, I just kind of feel like when we talk about this topic, the threes get excited because they know the joy of what it's like to be three and love envisioning a whole church living as a giver. The twos get a little uncomfortable and the ones get pretty upset. And as a church, man, let's be a church of threes. So the question becomes, so what? So we always ask this as we come out of God's word, okay? God speaks through his word. Jesus speaks. What, what does it mean for us? And the question that I want to leave you with is what is it going to take to become person number three? What's it gonna take for you? In fact, I would even, I'd even write that down. Maybe grab your phone out and just put that in. This is what it's going to take practically this week for me to be person number three. I'd write that down. What's it gonna take for you? For some of us, it's going to be living a life where we're looking for needs to fill, looking for ways to jump in, looking for ways to give and be generous because we don't live that way because we tend to live like keepers or takers. So you might want to write that down. For others of us, it might be, you know, I need to just start giving. I need to put, actually put it in my budget where I'm actually doing this consistently. No more random acts of gifts, but like this is something that I'm going to do regularly. I'm going to be a giver. But what's, what's it gonna be for you to move from number one or number two to person number three? God, I thank you so much for your word. I, I thank you for this text. Uh, God, I, I thank you that you meet us where we're where we're at. And uh, God, I, I just thank you for this church. I, I thank you that we can talk about difficult subjects, that we don't need to skirt around issues, but that we can just go for it like Jesus did. I, I thank you that. Thank you for the people in our church. I thank you for um, the generosity of, of so, so many in our midst. And God, I, I pray that this week, uh, me and I, I'm including myself, may we move more and more to being better and bigger givers. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.